Well, hello, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, I'm gonna keep working on the TRS-80 Model 2. It was in the last video that I refurbished this keyboard and got the thing booting and we confirmed the keyboard fully works, much to my relief. So today I wanna to work on the cosmetics of the entire computer and hope to get it fully reassembled. So without further ado, let's get right to it. So this is the outer shell of the Model 2, and it's really hard to convey in the camera how horrible the finish is on this thing. I've gone handheld, so I can try to get a little bit of the crud that's on this thing. Keep in mind on this case, I've given it a full wash, and I've cleaned it as best I can just using regular soap and water. So what's left on here is just permanently on the painted finish, and it's just something I need to try to address. Hopefully this gives you an idea of what the finish is like on the case. It's just in need of some serious attention. And this is another example of what the finish looks like. Now I fully don't expect that this case will ever look perfect again. I just want to try to make it look a little bit less dull and horrible like how it is right now. Take a look at this section right here. The paint is sort of a silver metallic and it should have a little bit of a shine to it, but there's absolutely nothing shiny about what's going on right here. But there is one spot on the case I've done a little test cleaning on, and it's this spot right here. And you can see that there's actually a little bit of a shine to it, and it's not so dull and horrible. Now, since the case has a painted finish, not that unlike a car, I'm gonna use car products on it to try to restore the luster a little bit. Now, I'm going to say up front that this type of work, the cosmetics and the restoration, is really outside of my wheelhouse. I'm just trying to get this thing looking a little bit better, and I just don't want to ruin the case, make it worse. So I know there's going to be lots of comments on this set of products here, that these things aren't the best, I should have used something else, insert better product here, all those types of things. Again, this is not a detailing channel or a restoration channel, it's a repair channel. So don't take anything I'm doing here as like a guide on how you should restore this. This is what I found just works for me. So I'm gonna start out by using this Meguiar Scratch X 2.0, which um, I've actually used on my car before to great success. And this is exactly what I did on this little test spot. I'll use a cloth and I'll rub this in, and it really does sort of take off the top layer of the paint. So you have to be careful with this because if, of course if I rub too hard, it could take the paint off entirely. This, this paint's probably incredibly thin and it would reveal the grayish plastic that's underneath. Once the scratch X has been applied, I'll buff it off and then I'll use this quick detailer here just to kind of give it a little bit of a clean. And then finally, I'll apply this Meguiar's Paint Protect. I've actually used this quite a bit on computers before and it does seem to do a pretty good job. That does leave the problem that there are all these vents here which are gonna be hard to kind of get down to the nooks and crannies. There's a little bit of crud down in these vents right here. As I said already, I'm not expecting perfection. I just wanna to try to make the main large surfaces not look so horrible. So I have some microfiber cloths and now begins the time-lapse of the restoration, so to speak, of the case. I really have some respect for professional car detailers. This type of thing is such hard work on your arms. I guess they use power tools when they're working on cars, which I couldn't do here because the paint is so thin, but it's still a lot of work. I was really amazed how much grit and crap was coming off on the cloth using the Scratch X. Although I think I'm realizing now that some of that was actually the paint and it's the same color as the oxidation. Just like when you're working on a car, you need to work on little sections at a time. That way you know which parts of the case you've already done and which you haven't. The vents were definitely a little bit of a pain. I used a screwdriver to push the cloth into them just to pick up all the extra compound that had got stuck in them. I've moved on to the bottom section here. I'm not trying to make this computer case look perfect and brand new again. I just want to try to make it look a little bit more presentable. 
to that end, there was quite a lot of rust residue still left on the back of the case where that back plate had rusted so badly, I decided not to try to attack that at all. I just left it as is. The front panel overall was in great shape. I used a scratch X on it and then I applied 303 protectant to all the black parts to really make it pop again. For the keyboard cable, I used some magic eraser, which is my usual trick, which made the cable look basically brand new again. All right, well, that was a lot of work, but I think it was worth it in the end. The case is looking a lot better. Let me assemble it on the bench here. All right, and there we go. And you'll notice I didn't peel this sticker off here. This is the old warranty void sticker for Boobed. I'm just gonna leave that like that. The whole thing is really in rough shape, so the perfection of removing every little sticker, it just doesn't really matter. Now you notice on the side of the case, the top part and the bottom has a different finish. I guess that's just the way it's always been. There's a different texture to the paint as well. This is smoother than this. It's just when the paint wasn't all weathered and damaged, you probably couldn't notice that. They're probably both the same color silver. The paint on this bottom section is actually a lot thicker than the paint on the top. So rubbing it with the scratch X really started to actually wear right through the paint on the top while on the bottom, it actually made it look pretty nice. This part, other than some scratches here, actually looks pretty good. It's not too mottled and horrible, but on the top, yeah, the, the surface finish is, is just not great. On the other side of the case, it's the same exact story. The bottom actually looks better than the top. If I get the angle just right, you'll notice it's all kind of splotchy, but I just don't think there's really much I can do about that, unfortunately. This case would need sanding and complete refinishing to look perfect again, and that's definitely not something I'm going to do right now. Notice this case keeps falling apart. I think once the front's on, it's gonna be okay, but that's happening because there are these little plastic parts that hold these two halves together, and the front one is snapped off. Speaking of the front, I've just placed it on here. Now it's all ready to fall apart because the bottom and the front are supposed to be screwed onto the chassis, and this top cover here is what you remove to service the machine but the front looks a million times better. 303 protectant really makes the black plastic pop again, and luckily none of the silver paint on the front has been marred or scuffed. So the one part of the case that you stare at the most, luckily is in pretty good shape. Well, speaking of the front panel, we also have the reset switch that I need to repair. Now this is a momentary switch, and uh, looks like it probably got bumped. And you can see that this little holder part here has been ripped off the PCB. It should be wrapped around just like that. So I need to try to get the little contact thing back into place and then reattach that. This whole metal part here is quite bent up. So I need to try to bend this back into shape. And uh, maybe then I can reassemble this thing. All right, so that goes in there and see that moves up and down when you slide it. All right, this thing is back together, but I haven't crimped it. I'm thinking there was supposed to be a spring in here because um, it's just floppy. And if I think about it, let's uh, see if I can get this out again. Hmm, seems pretty stuck in there. Well, there was a little L bracket and uh, the contacts are on one side and I think there was a spring on the other side. It's not the end of the world. It just means you're gonna have to push it and then put it back. The switch says UID and four amp, 125 volts AC, or five amps, 125 volts DC. You know, lab, ink, list, UID. I don't really see a part number or anything on here. So if anyone knows exactly what kind of switch this is, maybe I can find a, a replacement and uh, just swap this out. Oh, and I might as well do the reinstallation of this switch while I'm here. All right, next up before assembly is I have to reattach this back plate. Uh, this is where the fuse, the mains input, serial parallel, and the floppy drive external connector are connected. This was incredibly rusty. And uh, what I did is I took a wire wheel brush to it and I basically tried to sand off as much of the rust as I could. 
Then I sprayed it with several coats of rust converter. And then on the outside here, I actually applied some clear enamel. This is all Rust-Oleum stuff I used. It looks better, still has some pitting and marks where the rust was. But while this doesn't look amazing, the best part is it's not gonna keep rusting away. And that's really what I wanted to make sure would happen. This part fits into the back here and is screwed on with nuts and some bolts. And then I think as I go to assemble the machine, I need to kind of place it in here and then I can feed the AC, the fuse and the disc drive connector back through this and attach it all. I don't fully remember if the front should go on first and then the bottom or the bottom goes on first and then the front. I think the front has to go on first. Although on the front here, there were little clips that would clip into the bottom. I can see on the bottom, the little holes that goes into and these are broken on both sides. You really have to have some strength to reposition the heavy chassis and disc drive into the bottom section. It's this machine just weighs so much. Also, this type of work is not good for anyone who has really large hands because it, even for me and my hands aren't that big, it was a pretty tight fit getting them down inside the back of the computer to reattach everything. When I disassembled this computer, a lot of viewers suggested I use some tape on the end of a socket to help get them in and out. And I definitely used that to reassemble this machine. Otherwise it would have been impossible. I have to say assembling this computer is just as frustrating as taking it apart. There's just so little space in here. And then I run into issues because I'm, I made some mistakes putting it back together that basically mean it's gonna be such a pain to fix. So this connector right here that I have my fingers on, that's the serial port. They are down here on the bottom of the case and it connects right here to the CPU card. Well, the problem is it seems that down on the bottom here, I put the A and the B port in the wrong position. And Radio Shack basically gave so little length to this cable that I can't get it on to the CPU card. I can, but it pulls it super, super tight. And I think if I just reverse the A and the B down here, that would make it reach just. But the problem is, is there are screws with little nuts and everything all down there with washers and stuff. And if I take those off, I am just not sure I'm gonna be able to get my hand down in there to fix that problem. And I had no idea that this was gonna be a problem until this whole chassis was in the case, which of course is all screwed into the bottom now, which is really a pain because there's screws between cards and way deep down in there. So I need to decide if I'm gonna to try to take these out again or if I'm just gonna leave it like this and I just won't connect the serial port. I think I'm gonna to try to take these out. Oh, what a hassle. They really made some questionable design decisions when they made this thing. See, I'm afraid if I drop some of those, the little washer and the nut down in there, it's gonna be impossible to get out. Impossible. I am imagining that the technicians that worked on this probably had a very specialized set of tools that they had to help them with all these really annoying placements of of washers and screws and stuff like that. And there's the serial port assembly. What a stupid, stupid design. Okay, after a colossal struggle, uh, this thing is in. So the blue stripe here is pin one, which is up. And yeah, that makes a difference. This thing actually can connect up now and it's not super tight pulling really hard on the, the CPU card. All right, we're getting close now. So there's the power switch. There's little guides for the wire in there. These are the two knobs that just push on to the front. I think I have everything screwed in, uh, at least uh, this chassis into the plastic here. Okay, so power switch is in, reset switch is in, they're connected on the back. So I'm trying to see if those clips that are broken on the bottom are gonna cause a problem. Uh, I don't think so, because there's a couple screws on the bottom here and there's some on the top that hold the faceplate on. I am noticing that I have the disk drive too far back and there are screws on the bracket that hold it on that allow you to kind of move it back and forth. So I'm gonna to try to move it forward before I put the front cover on. I think it's gonna be possible. All right, everything on the front of the machine is looking good, including the alignment of the disk drive to the front panel. That looks good. 
all that's really left to do is install the top cover. And I have this bag here <laughs> of all the washers and bits that I haven't reinstalled in this machine. It's almost entirely washers, although there is the odd screw. I think the days of the Model 2 being moved around a lot where the fasteners might come loose because I didn't install some lock washers are far behind this computer. It's probably not gonna be moving much. So I'm not really too concerned <laughs> that a bunch of uh, lock washers and other washers and stuff are missing. I'm gonna stash this bag inside the computer here. So if a future owner of this machine ever wants to try to get all these little washers and stuff reinstalled properly, they can do so. All right, so the top cover of the machine Upon further inspection of it, it turned out that there were a lot more broken little clips on here than I had noticed right off the bat. On this side, there are two prongs and a larger prong, or whatever you want to call this thing, tab, I suppose, to help align this and hold it in place with the bottom cover. Well, it turned out on this side of the case, not only was one of the two prongs broken, but this tab was entirely missing. So I've gone ahead and used some ABS plastic to weld some parts onto here to hopefully make this a little bit more sturdy. I have a random box full of ABS plastic that I saved from computers that were broken or smashed, and I use those up to fix other things. So this larger tab here was part of an old Macintosh PowerBook machine that I guess had been stepped on or driven over, case was all cracked and ruined. Now, of course, it's offset from the original one because this has a kind of a texture where whenever it broke off, uh, it wasn't easy to adhere to. I did try there first, but it didn't stick. So I stuck it here where it was flat. And then right here, I recreated one of the little prongs. And yes, that's a piece of a C64 case. And I just uh, used acetone to reattach that. On the rear edge of the case, similar thing was going on. There were two broken prongs, one here and here. Also used C64 case pieces to uh, create new ones. And I did have to sand them down at a certain angle because the original ones that are on here kind of go off at a little bit of an angle to line up with the bottom part of the case. So hopefully this will work. Now, I have no idea if this is going to work at all. Maybe when I try to put this together, they'll just snap right off. But it was worth a try. And of course, if it doesn't work, I can always try again. Now, I remember when I first got this machine, the top cover barely stayed on. The whole case was tweaked and it, it, it didn't have any screws and basically would just fall off on its own. So hopefully me recreating these little prongs and parts will keep this cover on a little bit better than it was. Yeah. All right. Oh, something just snapped. <laughs> I was sort of uh, pushing it. I think it was the one on this side. Uh, yep, that's gone. All right, so that was a little bit of a fail. So this C64 one snapped, but it didn't come off where I glued it. It's just the plastic broke. That whole C64 was very brittle. So I guess um, it's not the best to use it to create little stress points on the case. The one on this side here and here are still there. Although the larger prong from the PowerBook, that did not stay. And interesting is the PowerBook plastic is really cracked from the ABS. Look at those cracks there. So it's quite possible that this is not a good mixture of ABS for using for this purpose. I've never actually tried to use this before uh, to do any kind of welding like this. All right, no worries. I am just gonna try to put this back together uh, with those tabs that are still left and hope that this works. Okay, that's on and that's on. And I was talking over it, but I think another one of those little tabs just snapped off. Let's look, <laughs> let's look at which one that one was. Okay, and it was this tab right here. So I think the problem is, like I was saying, is that at some point this machine was dropped or it was really impacted and it sort of tweaked the whole chassis. Uh, the whole front part here where the monitor is, it's too far this way. It should be more this way. When I had this disassembled, I noticed that it was bent. So I bent it back into shape, but I guess I didn't quite bend it enough. And when I reinstall the two fasteners on there, should keep this thing from at least falling off. And yeah, there'll be a bigger gap here, but it's just part of the battle scars that this old machine has. Okay, so there it is, fully assembled. Let's power this on. Incidentally, the reset switch does work fine. So you flip it up and then you get the white screen there and then it reboots off the computer. So even though there's no spring in there, uh, it does work fine. All right, so the Model 2 is to a state where we can try some more software on it. The problem is I only made this one TRS-DOS boot disk when I had this floppy drive connected to my PC. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook this up to the machine. This is a regular 
cheap GoTech floppy emulator that I got from eBay. The one difference between this and the ones you just buy off eBay is I flashed this with Flash Floppy, which is an open source firmware replacement for the GoTech that gives it far greater capabilities than it has out of the box. To hook this up to the machine, I don't need anything that I don't already have. Of course, one key component is the 50 pin to 34 pin adapter that I used when I was working on the eight inch disk drives hooked up to a PC. I'm just gonna use this thing in reverse and I'm gonna connect it all to the Model 2 externally using this cable, which is actually just a normal SCSI cable. Now I've attached a regular 50 pin edge connector so I could connect an external eight inch disk drive, but I'm actually not gonna be using this for the GoTech. I'm simply gonna be using these two 50 pin connectors. And then I'm gonna need a cable to hook the GoTech up to that adapter. And for that, I'm just gonna use a standard PC floppy cable. And for powering the GoTech, I'm gonna use this, which is a regular USB power bank hooked up to a cable that I made, which goes from a regular USB jack to the Berg connector that would plug into the GoTech. This is the connection for the external floppy drive chassis that you could buy to use with your Model 2. And normally if you don't have that chassis, you have a terminator installed here, which activates the drive termination on the internal floppy drive. If you refer back to my video all about termination, I talked about the fact that the original disk drive had these wire wrap jumper links that went between a couple unused pins and the pins that head to the termination resistors on the internal drive. So when you plug the terminator block into here, it actually connects those unused pins to those appropriate lines that need to be terminated. And that's the way you can terminate it by connecting this. Now I installed an eight inch disk drive that was from another machine. It didn't have those wire wrap loops. So I simply have the termination enable resistors connected to it, which means that that internal drive is always terminated whether you have this block installed or not. In fact, if I plug the terminator block into here, it wouldn't actually do anything. It would just connect those lines to unused pins that don't go anywhere. So nothing would happen at all but I'm gonna connect this SCSI cable to that connector so that I can plug the GoTech right into this machine. Because it's not labeled, the one thing that's really important is that pin one on this connector is over here on the left side. It's facing this edge of the computer. So when you connect the SCSI cable, you need to have the red stripe facing towards that side of the machine. Now on this particular cable, it had the notch right there to key into the SCSI connector. Now I had to cut that off because installing this in the correct orientation, there just wasn't enough room for it. But with that notch removed, this just connects right up without any issue. Now you might be asking right now, what about the drive termination? Because the internal drive is terminated and I haven't done anything to change that. Well, this GoTech actually terminates the signals as well. It uses 10K resistors versus the 100K resistors and it has them on all of the signal wires both the ones that it's supposed to terminate, which are the signals that come from the controller that go to the GoTech and the other direction, the signals that go from this to the controller. This machine will be terminating those signals on the controller itself with 150 ohms. And those other signals are gonna be terminated on the disk drive with 150 ohms as well. So this is gonna add an extra 10K to all of those lines, which is still within the margin. It should not cause any problem. In addition, the original SugarArt standard had those 150 ohm termination resistors installed on both ends of the cable because the original design supported very long floppy cables. And if you think about that external chassis that this machine can support, that thing sits under your desk. It's probably got like a six foot ribbon cable on it. And inside of that drive chassis, there are three more floppy drives plus the one in here. So there's just a lot of things on the bus causing reflection issues. When you use shorter cables, like I'm about to do here, having correct termination just doesn't matter as much. The one thing you just have to keep in mind is that you need some kind of pull-up resistors to five volts or it just will not work at all. So between the GoTech and the internal stuff in this machine, we are satisfying that requirement and the rest I'm not gonna worry about. Now this adapter has some jumpers on it and I have configured them appropriately for what we're about to do. So if you're gonna be hooking up a GoTech to your Model 2 and you're gonna use this adapter, well, take note of these settings so you can replicate them. So all I need to do is connect up the 50 pin cable like so. And then taking the 34 pin floppy cable, we're gonna be using the straight through portion only. The twist specifically is when you're using it with PCs and stuff like that. But when you're using GoTex on any machine that uses a pure SugarArt standard, like the original standard, which is what this uses, you would never use the twist. You simply rely on the drive select lines to pick 
which drive is which. And then all that's left is connecting the GoTek up appropriately, making sure you have pin one aligned with pin one and the stripe. And then with my USB to Berg connector, we're gonna just plug that in to give five volts to the GoTek. Of course, you could hook it up to a power supply or hook it up to five volts from inside the machine, but I'm gonna do it this way. And we're nearly ready to test. So because this says FF on it, I know that this is a flash floppy firmware, which is essential for using it as an eight inch disk drive. I do have the ff.cfg, which is the flash floppy config file on this thumb drive, configured with a couple options that are appropriate for this machine. Now, if you had the cable connected backwards, for instance, on the back, you had plugged that ribbon cable in the wrong way, what would happen is it wouldn't damage anything, but the machine would not be able to boot any longer. As you can see, it's booting off that floppy without any issue. Oh, and you see that? It just accessed the, the uh, GoTek. All right, I've locked the focus and the exposure, so hopefully uh, it's not too washed out or blurry. So we put caps lock on and we do DIR1 and we should see the contents of what's on the GoTek. And there it is. You can see it's displaying the track number there. Okay, and what I just listed here is the Model 2 diagnostic disc I downloaded from the Model 2 archive GitHub page. I'll put a link in the description to that. When you download the disk images, they're IMD files, like I showed in the disk drive video, the eight inch drive video. So you can easily, on a PC, take those IMDs and write them back to floppies, which is what I do with this boot disk. Uh, the GoTek with flash floppy doesn't natively support IMD. That's not a problem. You use the HFE utilities, which I'll also link in the description below, to load the IMD file and then save it as an HFE file. And when you do that and you put it on the thumb drive, then the GoTek with Flash Floppy can natively read and write to those disk formats. Now the problem is when you download the diagnostic disk, it's a master disk, meaning it wants you to make a backup copy first before you can even use it. Well, I've gone ahead and I've done that. I used another one of my blank floppies to allow it to write from the GoTek onto the disk. And now I can actually boot the machine off of this disk and go straight to the diagnostics. So we'll reset it. And there we go, I just ran the diagnostics. It's the diagnostics from 1986. Now it supports the Model 2 and also the Model 16 and I don't know, 12, I don't know, a bunch of different ones, including ones that have the 68,000 in them. Now I've done this off camera, but I've gone ahead and I've run these various diagnostics and so far everything is working perfectly with no errors, at least the ones that are appropriate for this machine. The one thing that doesn't work is number eight there, Model 2 System Diagnostics, which if I push eight, what happens is it starts to load and then it will freeze up like that. Oh wait, I just hit break and it went to this. How weird is that? That must have been in the instructions, which I didn't know about. All right, so why don't we just run auto function here and let's let it test itself. All right, so it's having problem on the PIO chip, which is the programmable IO chip. That may not actually be a problem because I don't have a loopback connector connected on the back of the machine. And it may well be that you need to have that loopback on there for it to work. Actually, PIO is parallel IO chip. And it looks like here it's testing serial stuff. But again, I don't have a, a loopback on the back, so I'm expecting it to have errors. Although it says pass count one. And while this runs, I'll just talk about the fact I ran the video test and that worked perfectly. I test the RAM, it does some other stuff. All of that came back fine. I did memory tests. That also worked perfectly. It doesn't seem like any of the RAM in this thing has any issues at all. I am just gonna reset out of this and I wanna go back to that system diagnostics now that I can get into it and, um, and see if I can do anything like CPU or any other logic tests. All right, so this is a bit weird. On reboot, it's just hanging. I'm wondering if I require a full power cycle of the whole machine after running those diagnostics. Sometimes it can leave stuff in a weird state that the bootstrap doesn't like on reboot. Now, while we wait for this to boot, people had mentioned that I needed to make sure I take this disk out of the drive or at least open it. Um, look at that, it's not working still. I wonder if this disk got corrupted. It may have gotten corrupted. People have mentioned that I need to make sure I take the disk out before I power cycle it because it's possible that the data on here can be erased. The thing is, this particular disk drive has a solenoid that removes the heads from the disk when it's not being accessed. So if it's sitting there idle and I shut the machine off, 
there's no way for it to actually cause corruption on the disc. Let's go back to the original boot disc, the one I made off the PC. See if this one works. All right, so this one is working fine. Uh, whoa. Wait a second, what's going on here? No, it's not working fine. Bad date. 12, what's, what's happening here? The backspace key doesn't work. What's happening? Ooh, the keyboard is acting very strange. Like I push two and I get threes. <laughs> oh dear. Like some of the keys give you the right key, but like eight gives me a nine, nine gives me a nine, seven gives me a seven, six gives me a six. It's like one of the bits is bad or something. And look, it just hung here booting up and this is off the original disc now. What's happening with this machine? Well, I'm gonna end this video here. I was really hoping to button up the machine and actually show some software running on it. I'd already downloaded it and got it working on the GoTech and even tried it before making this video. But the TRS-80 had other ideas and decided to give up the ghost and <laughs> fail on me. I am happy with the way the cosmetics look on the machine. I mean, the paint is splotchy and it's not great, but considering the condition of the machine when I got it, it's actually looking pretty good, especially from the front view with that black plastic that looks really good. In the next video, I will attempt to troubleshoot this machine and try to get it working again. And then maybe I can actually complete the series showing the machine running some software. So I hope you enjoyed the series so far. I know it's dragging on quite a bit, but hopefully it will be over soon. I'm gonna to try to mix in some other types of videos in so you don't get TRS-80 overload. And same for me, to be honest, I like to work on other things sometimes as opposed to the same machine the whole time. So in the meantime, don't forget to check out my second channel. There's all sorts of random and different types of videos over there to check out. Lots of troubleshooting and mail call and stuff like that. And if you like this series or this video, put your comments down below. And oh, if you have any ideas of what you think might be wrong as well, I would really appreciate that in the comment section. If you haven't already subscribed, I would really appreciate it if you did so. And I wanna thank my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. If you wanna become a patron, you can do so at the link in the description below. And I guess that's gonna be it for today's video. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.